Well, today I'm going to share with you one of the stupidest things I've ever done in my marriage. So if you're curious about some dirt on your pastor, uh, just wait and you'll hear it in just a moment. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeremy Bannister of Heights Christian Church, and we're going through the Bible in five years period of time. And if it's always been a goal of yours to go through the Word of God, we invite you on this journey with us. Uh, subscribe to our channel, click the bell for notifications, and you'll get a devotional every Monday through Saturday that goes through just a little bit of the scriptures and pulls one thing out of it to help us be more like Jesus. Well, right now we're going through the book of Matthew, and we're nearing the end uh, of this time where we're leading up to Jesus's crucifixion. And uh, it parallels with, believe it or not, one of the stupidest episodes in our marriage. Well, early in our marriage, just trying to figure things out and learning what it's like to be two becoming one. Uh, I remember we used to get into a lot of arguments our first couple of years of marriage, just trying to figure things out. It's, it's much different trying to live life on your own. Uh, and then living life with somebody else who you pledged yourself to. And so some of our arguments just ended with yelling and screaming and other things. And I was never violent to my wife outside of any yelling that was done. But I do remember one time where we were arguing and I decided that I wanted to really get my point across. And we were in our house and we were probably only just a couple of months married at this point. And I wanted to get my point across in the house. And so to be a macho guy, to talk about how important that this was, I decided to do something physical. And so I punched the wall. It's the only time I've ever punched the wall in my life. On top of it, I punched a stud in the wall. So I hit a solid area of the wall and I just hurt my hand all the more. It was a dumb thing to do. It was ridiculous. I've never done anything like it since. But I was trying to get a point across and trying to trying to be macho and get things my way to do it. And I did it in all the wrong ways. Instead of just admitting that maybe I was wrong and I should go about it in a different way. I just doubled down on what I thought was right to do and did something destructive in its place. Well, that's really what happens in our reading today. We are looking at two destructive ways of dealing with guilt. And uh, we look at Judas and we look at Pilate in this whole story of, of Jesus's crucifixion. And so we're going to read the first part of Matthew 27 together today and see if you can catch on with me. Uh, the same type of stupidity with, unfortunately, eternal results. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, it's not lawful to put them in the treasury since it's blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was fulfilled, what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. But when he, when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. 
Besides, while he was sitting in the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I've suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, Then then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. And so we see from this passage of Scripture two different people, right? And and these two different people want to, if you will, kind of push off their guilt for their role in the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, let's just be clear. Jesus died for every single one of our sins. Every single one of us are guilty in the sense that his death on that cross is for us. But these two were given a significant role in God's plan of redemption in this, and they're also fully culpable of their own actions. And so what we see is that we see this kind of pushing off in both places. Judas comes to, uh, comes to the, uh, the elders and the chief priests, and he says, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And he goes to them for forgiveness, but not necessarily to God. And he's like, what is that for you? See to it yourself. It's an interesting phrase that see to it yourself is used not just by the chief priest to Judas, but also by Pilate to the chief priest and the crowd at the crucifixion of Jesus. In both cases, they're trying to to, to allay the responsibility and place it upon someone else. In Judas's case, he throws the, the money into the temple and he goes off and he hangs himself. And he doesn't get to see the redemption of Jesus. At the same time, we see Pilate. Pilate trying to release Jesus, knowing that it's for jealousy's sake that the crowd uh, and the chief priests have handed him over. But as the crowd ensues and the riot gathers, and even as his wife says, hey, have nothing to do with him, instead of taking the responsibility of the power that he has in his hands— to release Jesus, to say that I'm on his side, he just merely says, I'm innocent of his blood while allowing the crowd to crucify him. See, in both of these cases, there's not a humble repentance. There's really kind of a doubling down. There might be regret in the case of Judas, but there's not a repentance. There's not, not something to say that, that God can take this back through, through a repentance and forgiveness that comes through him. And in Pilate's case, it's a sloughing off and saying, they're just going to do it anyway. Therefore, I'm not going to stand against them in doing so. But I'm going to say, nope, I'm not for this. You see, this, in both of these cases, neither Pilate nor Judas is considered a hero. They have succumbed to both peer pressure and to their own desires over that of God. And when we look at that, it's much like me punching the wall. All I end up doing is hurting myself, right? There's no real repentance in that. There's no sorrow in that. There might be regret because what I've done has caused me harm. But real repentance turns away from those types of actions. I can honestly say I have never since then ever punched a wall again out of anger. So there was true repentance in my part. But at that moment, at that time where I did it, I was only trying to prove a point. I had to come later to a repentance and say that 
I was wrong in doing those things. As a matter of fact, by coming with that attitude to begin with, I would have saved myself punching that stud and a whole lot of pain. We can do the same thing and prevent a lot of pain from happening in our lives by humbly coming on Christ's terms to forgiveness and repentance at the cross and at the feet of Jesus, rather than trying to do things our way and see to it ourselves. Pray that helps you today. I pray that helps me today as we try to humble ourselves before the Lord as we serve him. God bless you, and we will talk with you again tomorrow.